In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, bless us and strengthen us and keep us by your grace and bless our gathering that we may edify one another in word in thought and deed. I ask this in your holy name, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and ever and into the ages of ages. Everybody say amen. 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 Well, as you know, um, I probably you, 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 you know who I am from my first introduction, but for those of you who don't know, my name is Father Moses Berry. And I live in this very house that my great grandparents built in 1875. Some people say 1873, but the deed, you can't make out on the deed, whether it's a five or a three. So I say 1875. And um, I live in that house that they built. And they were, um, I was raised here by children of slaves. My grandmother was a child of a slave. Her father, Wallace White, was the first black man in the Missouri State Cavalry. They fought at Vicksburg. And when they mustered out in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, after the end of the Civil War, he had nowhere to go because he was field, he was freed from a field in Mount Sterling, Kentucky by the Missouri Fifth Cavalry. And as the story goes, my grandmother relates this story to all of the children. She says, and, the, and they came up, came up on him in his master's field when he was plowing with a mule. And they said, do you wanna go with us? And he said, deed I do, which is to say, indeed I do. And he left and, and stayed with those guys, with his regiment until the end of the Civil War. And then he had nowhere to go. so. He decided to follow the Missouri Fifth Cavalry back to Missouri, where he settled. And um, so I'm, I'm a Missourian through and through. Um, and they were also, you know, Christian men and women, so much so that they did not trust in this world. As a matter of fact, if they, they weren't even allowed to have faith in this world because they had no rights in this American society. So what I hope to do in this seminar, in this seminar, is to give you a, an idea, an overview, an overview based on a tradition of African American otherworldly Christianity, as it was passed on to me. And uh, you know, they they didn't look for any kind of reward or compensation in this world because they didn't have rights. I mean, I don't want to sound like a, an ancient old guy, but you know, the Civil Rights Voting Act didn't even come into existence until I was a, a teenager. So these people that helped raise me did not um, rely on this world for any kind of satisfaction or compensation. They looked for the world to come. And in that, looking at the world to come, they taught my brothers and sisters and all the other children around here how to look at our brothers and sisters in a way that did not rely on this world. As I said once before earlier, and I said this many times, you may have heard me say it, already but when i have i have neck irons and a ball and chains that belong to my ancestors and padlocks from their slave chains and i say that they were um these were mean instruments that held the slave captive but they were also um precious instruments because they were the they were the very manacles of iron that bound them to this earth. And I think sometimes that they are, and that they were freer than I am, because uh, I am uh, free in some respects, but in most respects, I'm a slave, 
more than they are. I'm a slave to conventionality. I'm a slave to modernity. I'm a slave to this world. And, and I wonder about being treated properly. I wondered about being treated fairly. And they didn't have those wonders or those concerns because they did not rely on this world. And they brought us up to treat one another in that same way. And everyone that we meet, and everyone that we met, they taught us to, um, to treat them like we wanted to be treated. Not in just some philosophical way, but literally the way that we wanted to be treated. I remember being a boy here in our front yard with my brother Charles, my older brother Charles and I, when we were about 10 and 11 years old. And we have property here. We have, we have, uh, you know, we have um, acres of woods and acres of fields. And we used to sell our um, trees. We had walnut trees and um, oak trees. And we still sell some of those trees to help thin out the forest. But I remember there were buyers from Japan who would come here um, to Missouri and, and they would send their brokers to, um, to negotiate the buying of the trees on, on the local property. And they would come to my grandmother's house and they, and they, would, um, you know, they would bicker with her, they would bargain with her about the price of her trees. And she would always, you know, she was quite a bargainer. She was quite a horse trader, as they say. And they would, they would give her a ridiculously low, low bid on, on, her, um, on her trees. And she would, she would go into a sort of, sort of a, a subservient stance. She would go into a stance that, that, that was sort of like, um, you know, she didn't know what was going on. And she would say to them, as I remember, I'm sorry, boss, but I can't uh, sell you that for that price, but, but maybe you can find a buyer further on down the road somewhere who could meet that price. I'll just better hold on to those trees, boss. And she was just sort of bow her head a little bit. And my brother Charles and I were so, um, so ashamed of the way that she was acting because we were born in a different generation. We were born in that generation as I described or according to Eugene Fields, the great poet from Missouri, who says that I was between the dark and the daylight. That's when I was born in this country in 1950. Between the dark and the daylight, when the night was beginning to lower. And so my brother and I were just so embarrassed that my grandmother would act like such a, a shuffling Negro, as we described it or as a, an Uncle Tom or an Aunt Jemima. But she would, and so we went away and we said, Grandma, why did you do that? Because we knew how she spoke and she was quite an elegant lady. And, and so why did you do that? She said, don't worry. I just didn't want them to feel bad. I didn't want them to feel bad. They'll be back, don't worry. And as it turned out in about an, an hour or so, those guys came back and they said, well, I think that we can meet your price. And my grandmother would reply, oh, thank you very much. I think that's a good idea. You probably made a good move because she knew that they were her brothers and sisters. And that's what she passed on to us. And that's what all the old folks around here passed on to us, all those children of slaves, that it was better to be humble. Uh, and because there was so much power that was contained in this humility. There was another one of those old ladies who lived around here. Her name was Miss Olivia Murray. And Miss Olivia was um, born in 1898 and she died in 1991. She was a great, um, great lady in this town. She was over six foot tall and she would walk around with a basket under her arms and she, she carried, uh, you know, um, another carton under, the, under, other, under her other arm. And she had a little dog named Wiggy that ran in between her legs. And she would walk around town like this. And she was quite an embarrassment to most of us. 
young children who are trying to shake off the fetters of subserviency. And there she was walking around town looking like Aunt Jemima. And as I always say, not the new Aunt Jemima, not the cute Aunt Jemima of, of, the, of, the, of our day, but the old Aunt Jemima. And, and I came to my mother one day and I told her that, that she was gonna to have to do something about Miss Olivia because Miss Olivia was an embarrassment to us. And mom said to, to me, do you know what she has in that basket? And I told her, no, I don't know, and I don't care. And mom went on to say, she has eggs in there from her chickens and canned goods from her garden. And she goes around to families who are down on their luck. And mom went on to say that she saved many families' life around here, white and black, including ours. I felt so ashamed because I could have known a saint. And so afterwards I came to my mom and I told her that I was sorry. I was sorry because I, I had judged her so harshly. And she was only always kind to me. She was only always interested in my welfare. And mom said, let that be a lesson to you. Let that be a lesson to you that when you see people on the highways and byways of this world, when you see those, even those who are in the hedges and the highways of this world, treat them properly, to always treat them with respect. 